Good morning, everybody. It is Mrs. Holly. What are we doing today? We are going to take a look at ancient Greece. In particular, how geography affected Greece, um, what the Greek city-states were and what made them different. And we're gonna start off because this is really the beginning of what we call the classical era in history. So we're gonna start with the definition of what that means. So on page two in your brand new unit two workbook, yay! I wanna know what do you think the words classical or classic make you think of? What do those make you think of? So take a minute and type something down and then press play to take a look. All right, my friends. So what do the words classic and classical make you think of? Well, to me, when I think of these words, they make me think of something very, very old or very cultured or fancy. And remember, your definitions do not have to match my definitions, okay? So number two, based on the definition or based on what we said is the definition of classical, why do you think we study what's called the classical era? Again, stop the presentation, come up with an answer, and then press play to review. Welcome back, friends. All right, why do you think we studied this classical era? What did you write? Well, here's what I wrote. And again, my answers are probably gonna be very different from yours, and that's okay. So here's what I wrote. I said, we study the classical era because it was the time when civilizations experienced golden ages, making great contributions to history. Most of the world's religions were also created during this time, so it's worthy of studying. Okay, now that we've looked at what that means, what classical means, the classical age, the classical era, or the age of classical civilizations, because we're starting with Greece, what I'd like you to do is stop the video and I'd like you to label your map on page three. Okay, now I put some additional things on here just so you could kind of get a, an idea of where things are. So over here actually on, on the A map would be Italy. So this is also in the Mediterranean Sea right here, Greece. And the main part of Greece here is a peninsula, meaning it's surrounded on three sides by water. You have the Ionian Sea to the west, the Mediterranean Sea to the south, and then the Aegean Sea to the east. Okay, this part of Greece is called Peloponnesus. This island down here is Crete. Santorini is in here somewhere. Rhodes. Now, here are two important city-states that we are gonna be learning a, a lot about. Athens, right here, which is part of the mainland. And then Sparta, which is on Peloponnesus. We're gonna talk about those. I put Olympia on here. I had to put Delphi because that's where the most famous oracle lived. Um, the oracle was a woman who could tell the future and um, rulers from all these different city-states would go to Delphi to ask the oracle questions about their future, whether they'd be successful or not. So kind of interesting. Um, Thebes is here, Attica here. You've got Mount Olympus over here. I put that because it was believed that that's where the gods and goddesses lived. 
Here is um, north of Greece. It's not actually part of Greece, uh, but it's Macedonia. It's all one big territory. Um, we're going to talk about a ruler who was from Macedonia who is very successful in taking over Greece. So I wanted you to kind of have an idea where Macedonia was. Persia is here, so Iran. Okay, so these are the, the main locations that you really should know where they are. So if you need to stop the video and add these locations on your map, that's fine. Just press play to continue. All right, I want to talk about the geography of ancient Greece. We know that it was located in southeastern Europe. It's made up of a mainland located on a peninsula and there are over a thousand rocky islands that make up part of Greece. So technically it's also an archipelago, which means it's a series of islands. Almost 75% of Greece is covered by mountains. Do you remember another place we talked about that had a similar statistic? One of the ancient societies um, that civilizations was covered by a great amount of mountains. Do you remember what that was? It was ancient China. Yeah. So about 75% of ancient Greece is also mountainous. As I said, when we looked at the map, ancient Greece is surrounded on three sides by water. So the Ionian Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the most famous, the Mediterranean Sea. Remember, if you need to stop the video to fill in your notes, do so at any time. Just don't forget to press play to start again. So Greece has hot summers and very mild winters, which makes it a great tourist spot. <laughs> However, the rocky soil makes large scale farming extremely difficult. Now, the ancient Greeks, just like modern day Greeks, do grow certain foods that they're known for, like grapes and olives, grow really well in that climate and in that soil. But a lot of the city-states were not able to grow enough of their own food because of this rocky soil and because of the mountains. So several of the city-states would have to take what they needed from other people. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And because they're surrounded on three sides by water, a lot of the food that they did have came from the water. So big part of their economy and their food is made up of sea life. Yummy, if you ask me. We're gonna go on to page four in your workbook. Once you're done writing this down, Okay, so the impact of the geography. The mountains did help protect the ancient Greeks. It did make it harder for foreigners to attack. It didn't make it impossible, however, because the ancient Greeks frequently attacked each other. So obviously it was not impossible. However, mountains did make it difficult for the different city-states in Greece to communicate and exchange ideas. So in other words, it kept the different people separated like mountains will do. So really one of the biggest things I want you to get out of the fact that Greece is so mountainous is that it made unification very, very difficult, if not impossible. Really, the only times the Greeks came together 
was to fight, to fight a common enemy. So because of the mountains, there was never a single unified government for all of Greece. And as a result of that, the Greeks formed separate independent city-states. So I know you're asking, Mrs. Holly, what is a city-state? Well, it's a good thing you ask because a city-state is really an independent city with its own government and its own economy. Now, one thing I, I want you to understand is that the Greek city-states were independent, but as this gentleman is saying, they did share the basically the same culture, they all spoke Greek, and they shared the same religious beliefs. So the belief in the Greek gods and goddesses, but they all had their own different economic systems and they all, all had their own separate governments. Okay, let's do a little bit of review on page four. So question number one says, identify two geographic features that had a great impact on the ancient Greeks. When you identify something, you just list them. Okay, so stop the video, list two geographic features that had a great impact on the ancient Greeks. Don't forget to press play to start again. All right, let's see what I put. I said that the mountains and the seas had great impacts on the ancient Greeks. And so question number two says, describe how these features impacted the ancient Greeks. So when you identify something, you're just listing it. And then when you describe it, you're actually going into detail. You're, ex you're doing more than really explaining. Okay, you're gonna describe it. So stop the video, please. Type your response and then press play to review. Okay, friends, welcome back. Okay, I said that the mountains separated the Greek cities, so they all developed into their own independent city states, each with their own government and economy. That was one thing. Now, I don't care how you put it, as long as you mentioned that the, um, the mountains encourage the development of these independent city states. That's what you need to know. I also said, because I had mentioned the seas here, I have to describe here. Sorry about that. Let's get rid of that. I hate that. I don't know why that, oops. I don't know why that does that. Sorry. All right, I said the seas allowed the Greeks to fish and trade among the Greek islands more easily, which is true. We said seafood made up a great part of their diet and was a huge part of their economy. And because Greece is made up of so many little islands, being able to sail to those islands allowed the Greeks to trade more easily with each other. All right, let's move on to page five and talk a little bit about those city-states that we mentioned. So the time period we're talking about is from the 700s all the way through 336 BCE, before the Common Era. Remember when you're in BCE, you start with the large numbers and you work towards zero. So during this period, there were over a thousand different Greek city-states. Remember, they all developed because they were isolated by the mountains. We call city-states a polis. City-states are called polis. And that's actually where we get the word for big cities like metropolis from the Greek word for city-state, 
polis. Um, it is not uncommon to see the term polis on the regent's exam when speaking about ancient Greece. So city-states are independent cities with their own government and their own economic system. And while the Greek city-states were politically and economically independent, they all spoke the same language and they shared the same religious ideas and culture. So just a little review again. So even though each city-state was independent, they did have some similar features. So the city-states always included a city and then the surrounding villages, fields, and orchards, whether they're growing grapes or olives. So let's look at some of those other similar features. Okay, each city-state had a marketplace, an agora, at the center of the city. And not only did people go there to buy food and trade for food, it also served as a meeting place where the men would come together and talk about their ideas regarding government and possibly philosophy. So the Agora was very important. It played an important part of Greek life. Each, each city-state had an Acropolis at the center of the city. Now, an Acropolis is a fortified hill. So usually around the center, you would see a large hill. And that is where their government buildings would usually be and their religious buildings. So at the top, you have usually a large temple built in honor of whoever the local god or goddess was. All right, so we've got a, a question down on the bottom of page five. This says six, but it should say five. And the question asks you to explain why each city-state developed its own government and economy. We know this, think geography. So stop the video, think up an answer, type an answer in, and then press play to review. All right, friends, hopefully your answer is very similar to mine. Okay, we know that city-states developed their own governments and economies because they weren't unified. They were separated by the mountains, and so they developed slightly differently. Okay, now we're moving on to page six. Talk a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not going on to page six. We're going to watch a video about the Greek city-states. So this should be good. As we reopen, don't you want your pocket of America to still feel like its own? We're autonomous and independent. Ooh, let's start at the beginning. How about we do that? <laughs> the ancient era is filled with stories from major empires and kingdoms, like the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Hittites. But the history of ancient Greece took a different route. When we talk about Greece in ancient times, we are not simply talking about a kingdom, an empire, or a country, because they were not organized this way. Greece was formed by a large amount of city-states. Each city-state was like a tiny country. The Greek cities had total sovereignty over their territories because their governments were autonomous and independent. Therefore, a unified Greek state did not exist back then as it does now. Since each city was autonomous and independent, their customs and forms of government could be quite different between them. They could be organized as democracies, as it happened in Athens, where the power was in the hands of the citizens. 
It could also be an aristocracy like in Thebes or Corinth, where the noblemen had the power. And there were also oligarchies, where a tiny group of citizens ruled everyone else, as it was the case of Sparta. The Greeks from this period did not proclaim themselves as Greeks, but as Hellenic. Based on Greek mythology, Hellenus was the son of Deucalion and Pyra, the survivors of the flood carried by Zeus and Poseidon. This way, the Greeks were direct descendants of Hellenus. Therefore, religion had a major role in the establishment of a common identity between Greek city-states. The same was valid for the Greek language, which, in spite of its variations, was shared by all Greeks. Among the different Greek city-states, some were more notorious than others. Among them, we have Athens, the birthplace of democracy and Western culture. Its name derives from the city's protective deity and the goddess of wisdom. The powerful Sparta, a city with a strong military culture, descended from the Doric invaders, who, according to legend, were the heirs of the great hero Hercules. The city of Thebes, founded where once was the old kingdom of Boeotia, was the home of the mythological kings Oedipus and Cadmus, the city's founder. The city of Corinth, in turn, had a strategic location separating the peninsula of the Peloponnese from the rest of Greece, and, for that, the city was always involved in major clashes. We cannot forget the city of Olympia, home of the Olympic Games. This Panhellenic event was crucial to strengthen the cultural bonds between the different cities. The Greek model of city-states achieved major success. The cities were culturally and economically prosperous. However, their success brought a brand new problem, overpopulation. To fix the issue, the Greeks started to launch expeditions to colonize new lands. This movement became known as the Second Greek Diaspora, since the first happened after the Doric invasion. Thus, the Greeks scattered themselves throughout a major portion of the Mediterranean lands. Colonies were established in France, Spain, Africa, in the Italian peninsula, and in the east. The Greek city-states founded where today we see Turkey's coastline, like for instance Samos and Miletus, developed themselves quite rapidly, taking advantage of new forms of knowledge brought from the contacts established with new cultures due to trade activities. These cities became immensely wealthy, and so they were a target for the powerful Persian Empire. The clash between the Greek city-states and the world's largest empire appeared to be unavoidable. There we go. All right. Let's go back to our presentation. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about Greek religion. The Greeks were polytheistic. Remember the word poly means many. So they worshiped many gods and goddesses. Now these gods and goddesses were very human-like. They had human characteristics. They felt anger and passion and sadness and happiness and jealousy. And they also could take on human forms. So according to the Greeks, their gods and goddesses fought, had children, lied, murdered, and acted quite a bit like humans. Now, the Greeks believed that they could communicate with the gods, but they needed an oracle to do that. And I mentioned the uh, oracle at Delphi. Usually the oracle was a priestess, it was usually a woman, that um, they believed the gods spoke through. And the most important one was at Delphi. And the Greeks believed that the majority of their gods and goddesses lived on the top of Mount Olympus, which was the highest mountain in the Greek mainland. So just a, a very quick summary of religion. We'll talk about trade. So it says that the city-states traded throughout the Mediterranean region, and they actually established colonies around the Mediterranean and also around the Black Sea. A colony means that you send Greeks somewhere else. They 
kind of take over small areas of other places and then use those other places to gain raw materials that they are lacking back at home. So if, for example, the Spartans, their land was very rocky, so they didn't have enough land to farm on. So they would go and they didn't colonize, they went and they took everything they needed from other people. But some of the other city-states did colonize. And not only would they use their colonies to get raw materials like food and other things that they were lacking, but they also used their colonies to trade with. So that was important. So colonies supplied their parent city with grain and other goods because it was hard to farm in some of the areas in Greece. All right, you've got a question to answer now on the bottom of page six. What city-states have you heard of and what do you know about them? They mentioned quite a few actually in the short video. So why don't you stop the video right now, our presentation, and maybe list a few that you remember or that you learned about before and then press play and we'll review them. All right, friends, welcome back. Here are the two big city-states that everyone should know about. There are many others. Um, Athens, we know Athens is important because it was the birthplace of democracy, which is a form of government where people participate actively we know that the Athenians valued learning. They enjoyed learning um, and they would enjoy welcoming foreigners who could teach them new knowledge. And one of the other most famous was Sparta. Now, Sparta didn't value learning as in a traditional education. They valued learning because um, they valued warfare. So boys at age seven were taken from their homes and they would start their training to be warriors. So they did get an education, but it was in warfare. Um, we also remember Sparta because they were very, very particular because they were a city-state based on war and discipline all newborn babies were checked by these city's elders. And if a baby was weak or sick or deformed, then that baby was killed. Yep, pretty harsh. All right. So just a little review here, how geography impacted the formation of city-states Mountains made unification difficult, which then led to the formation of independent city-states. Now what we're going to do is take a look at Athens and Sparta separately because they were so different. So Athens is located northeast of Peloponnesus on Attica. They were originally founded by the descendants of the Mycenaeans who had settled there earlier. The city-state is named after the goddess Athena, so their temple was built to honor Athena. And Athens was one of the largest city-states in all of ancient Greece. Attica was important because it had a lot of natural resources like gold and lead and marble. So this would help make Athens wealthy. And while Sparta was known for their army, Athens was quite famous for their powerful navy. So I know what you're asking. You're asking who lived in Athens? Well, you've got 
different people who lived in Athens. This man here, he's an Athenian, and he says his father was a citizen of Athens and his mother was born to Athenian parents. So he's full-blooded Athenian. So since he's a male, he's a citizen with rights. He can own land and he is expected to participate in the government. It was required that male citizens, men who were born there to Athenian parents, free Athenian parents had to participate in the government. So citizens are one group who lived in Athens. This is a beautiful Greek urn and it was made by a medic. Medics were free foreigners who lived and worked in Athens. Most of them were artisans or merchants. And depending on when they lived in Athens, they may or may not have been considered citizens. At some points, they were considered citizens, the men anyway, and at other points, they were not. So it really depended on when they were there. So you've got citizens and you've got medics, and then you've got these shackles here who belonged to a slave. So you've got slaves in Athens as well. And the slaves worked on farms, they worked in the mines. Remember I said they had coal, gold mines. They worked as craftsmen and even in homes as personal servants. Now the slaves in Athens were not considered citizens, therefore they had no rights at all. So they couldn't participate in government, they had no freedom. And the majority of them um, became slaves because they were conquered by Athens. You could also become a slave if you owed someone money and failed to pay them back. So you've got citizens, medics, and slaves who live in Athens. So what was life like as an Athenian? Well, a week after being born, male citizens would receive their name and this would bring them officially into Athens as a citizen, as a newborn. All boys were expected to be educated because it was expected that they would hold public office. In other words, it was expected that they would participate in the government of Athens. So wealthy families would hire tutors to teach their sons. Um, other families would pay money for their sons to attend schools. Okay, we're gonna move on to page eight in your notes, in your workbook. So boys would go to school or be tutored from ages seven to 18. It's a long time. And they learned literature and rhetoric, which is the art of public speaking. And it says here they used Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Homer was a famous Greek writer and he wrote these two books called the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad, as you can see, the Cyclops on the left here is telling us, the Iliad tells the story of the Trojan War. And in this story, the hero Odysseus meets the Cyclops during his 10 year journey home from Ithaca after the fall of the city of Troy. So they were well read Athenian boys were. So from ages 18 to 20, the men would all, well, boys, would serve for two years in the military. It was required. Females, on the other hand, did not receive a formal education. They were not tutored. They were not sent to school. They were taught by their mothers at home how to be good wives and mothers. They were taught how to run a household. 
women in Athens were not considered citizens and really had no political power at all. It's interesting that Athens is the birthplace of democracy, which, you know, they are set up based on the idea that people have the right to participate in the government, and yet the women in Athens had very few rights. The majority of them were almost always at home. We know that a lot of our democratic principles here in the United States are traced back to the democratic principles in Athens. A democracy, as I said earlier, is a government where the power comes from the people. And you could have a direct democracy where all eligible citizens men participated directly so they would vote on every single issue on every single law or you could have an indirect democracy called a republic where the people elect representatives to speak for them in the government because there's so many people it wouldn't make sense to have everyone vote on every single issue athens had a direct democracy where all eligible men all eligible citizens participated directly in the government. So at first, only free adult male Athenians who owned land were considered citizens and could participate in the government. But as I mentioned before with the medics, the definition of what a citizen was would change throughout Athens history. All Athenian citizens were believed to be qualified for public office. In other words, all men after the age of 20, after they served military service, they were well educated, they were good at public speaking, so they were perfectly qualified to serve in their government. And instead of electing people to serve in government, they used, in Athens, they used a lottery system where all citizens had an equal chance of being picked to participate. And sometimes, depending on the situation, as their government evolved, they were sometimes ruled by tyrants What's a tyrant? Do you know what a tyrant is? A tyrant is someone who has complete control um, and rules very harshly. And this was not the norm. It was usually only during periods of emergencies that when decisions needed to be made quickly. And here you have, actually this is Hercules over here from the cartoon. And he is telling you in Greek history, a tyrant as a ruler was not really a bad thing. It was just that one person was in control. And again, that was usually during times of war or an emergency of some kind when decisions had to be made quickly. Now at the bottom of page eight, it asks you, which ancient Greek social class would you have rather been born into and why? Would you rather be a citizen? Would you rather be a medic? Would you rather be a slave? Would you rather be a male or female? Hmm. This one's up to you. Personally, I probably would have liked to have been an artisan, so maybe a medic. I don't like to make important decisions that could have a bad impact on people. I don't like a lot of responsibility. So I don't know that I would wanna be a citizen, a male citizen. But whichever you pick, I'm sure you have a good reason. 
All right, we're going to talk about the golden age of Greece. And in the video, it mentioned the Persian Wars. Because several of the Greek city-states were so wealthy from trade and from the gold and other natural resources that they had, the Persians tried to take over Greece and failed. And this period after the Persian Wars, Athens became extremely prosperous. Not necessarily because they earned it, but <laughs> they ended up controlling the money. So this is what we call their golden age. So the golden age was a period of great innovation in democracy. Innovation meaning change or advancements. So advancements in government, art, philosophy, drama, poetry, you name it. And these cultural innovations lasted from around 461 to 429 BCE. The ruler who was in power during quite a bit of this time was Pericles. So we consider him to be, we consider this age to be called, sometimes we call it the age of Pericles or the golden age of Pericles. Now, Pericles was a patron of the arts and a patron of the education, meaning he supported the arts and education. And he's the one that controlled the money. So he was able to put a lot of money into the arts and education in Athens. And he's going to extend a lot of reforms of a previous ruler. So it was a time of change, and it was positive change. He is also the mastermind behind the building of the Parthenon in Athens. The Parthenon was the temple built to honor the goddess Athena, and it was built somewhere between 447 and 432 BCE, a beautiful achievement. And the Parthenon was built using perspective, meaning, I'm just going to show you here down here at the bottom, see these columns? This is a cartoon, but the Parthenon had many columns. They were wider at the base and narrower at the top. So your eye was naturally drawn to the top of the building. And it gave the impression of distance, of height. And the Greeks were one of the first to use perspective in their art or building. There were other artists like Myron and Phidias who created sculptures of the perfect human form. Athenians valued the perfect human form. Um, not necessarily what people actually looked like, but what they thought the perfect person should look like. Myron is famous for this sculpture of the discus thrower. Remember, um, the Olympics were in Greece. And actually, the men who participated did not wear clothes while they were taking part in the events. Phidias created sculptures that were later put in the Parthenon, in that temple built to honor Athena. Okay, as far, as far as pottery, they were the ancient Greeks in Athens were famous for their pottery. 
they would paint beautiful murals around the pottery. They're very famous for their red on the black background, or sometimes they had black pictures on a red background. Very distinctive. In theater, you've got the creation of comedies and tragedies during this period. Tragedies uh, occur where the lead character is struggling against fate and suffers a very unhappy or tragic ending. Uh, the opposite would be a comedy, which is a play that has humorous themes and a happy ending. But these were all invented in Athens. Okay, we are now on page 10 in your workbook. The Greeks were famous for their advances in philosophy. Socrates, who was alive from 470 to around 399 BCE, is famous for developing the Socratic method of questioning. And this was done to get his students to defend their beliefs, defend their ideas. Unfortunately, in 399, he was put on trial and found guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens because he refused to worship the gods of the state. He was actually sentenced to death and he picked his his um, method of dying. He chose to drink hemlock juice, and that is what killed him. And here is one of his famous quotes. There is only one good knowledge and one evil, ignorance. So knowledge is good, he believed, and ignorance, meaning you, you aren't knowledgeable, he said was evil. Plato was a student of Socrates. He was alive from 427 um, to 347 BCE. And he will open a school after Socrates dies and he will teach many of the same students that Socrates had begun teaching. One of his most famous writings was called The Republic. And it was all about his views of what the perfect government should be. And one of his famous quotes, those who don't know must learn from those who do. So education, very important to Plato. And lastly, Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Plato's. He was alive from 384 to 322 BCE. So he studied with Plato. He will be a tutor of the famous ruler Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is Macedonian. His father, Philip, will take over Greece, and he, and then he will die. Um, Alexander takes over for him and is one of the most successful rulers in all of ancient history. Um, much of it is attributed to the education he received from Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote and edited more than 200 books on all kinds of different topics. And he did write books on politics as well. So that is the Greek golden age or the age of Pericles. Let's look at this little video just to give you a, another perspective of the golden age of Athens. His name was Pericles, and he was so influential in ancient Athens that the golden age of that city-state from 449 to 429 BC is known as the Age of Pericles. 
Heracles, a name that means surrounded by glory. And from his birth in the first years of the 5th century to a noble Athenian family, Heracles lived a life of glorious splendor and privilege. There was military glory too in the last years of the Persian Wars. Before he was 30, Pericles achieved the rank of strategos, or general, a position he would use to become the de facto leader of Athens and restructure the city-state in profound ways. Some of them are still visible more than 2,000 years later on the Acropolis, the high hill above the city. The Erechtheum, the Temple of Athena Nike, the Parthenon, white marble marvels of engineering that were part of nationwide public works and fortification projects Pericles initiated. But stone monuments, said Pericles, were not as great a legacy as what is woven into the lives of others. And Pericles changed the lives of Athenians by reforming the city's constitution and government. Pericles moved to replace the aristocrats on Athens' leadership council with a majority vote assembly that, he said, favors the many instead of the few. He opened civil service positions to all citizens, regardless of class, pushed for laws that afford equal justice to all in their private differences, arranged pay for those serving on juries. He championed freedom of speech, political opinion, and action. At Athens, we live exactly as we please, the historian Thucydides quotes Pericles as saying, our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. One neighboring state, Sparta, saw the increasingly powerful Athens not as an ideal to follow, but a threat to eliminate. In 431 BC, the powerful Spartan army invaded Greece to fight its way to Athens and found a deserted countryside. Heracles had collected all the residents within the walls of Athens. It was the grand strategy of Strategos Pericles, take a strong defensive position, exhaust the attackers, fight to the death. Hundreds did. In his famous funeral oration, which Thucydides recorded and paraphrased in the history of the Peloponnesian War, Heracles honored the war dead for choosing to die resisting rather than to live submitting. Pericles and those massed behind the walls of Athens could not resist what attacked from within, the plague. It killed thousands, and finally Pericles himself in 429 BC. The Peloponnesian War finally ended in 404 BC. The walls of Athens destroyed, the Spartans victorious. The age of Pericles was over. But the ideas and ideals of Pericles on freedom, equality, citizenship, and civic duty live on, echoed in codes of laws and constitutions written in the century since. All right, just another view of Pericles. Okay, now we're going to look at the city-state of Athens. Here we know that it's located on Peloponnesus, which is the peninsula in southern Greece. And it was the largest city in Laconia. Their land was rich in iron ore. So not much for farming. So they were able to grow by invading other neighboring city-states. And again, that's how they had to get much of their food. Now, unlike the Athenians who welcomed education and welcomed foreigners, the Spartans were very, very suspicious of new ideas. They did not welcome foreigners. Um, in fact, they didn't want foreigners to bring their weird influences in and ruin their culture. 
Spartans had a reputation for being laconic, meaning they didn't use a lot of words. They said what they meant and they said it as briefly as possible. The Spartans did tend to be poorer than other Greeks. They didn't really care too much about the arts and science, although they were very successful usually in the Olympic games because their citizens were in fantastic physical shape. So because they didn't value education as we know it, um, as the Athenians knew it, as like Athenians were taught to read and write, well, the men anyway, um, they got a good education. Well, the Spartans did care about education, but it was military education. So what we do know about Sparta doesn't come from works that they created, it comes from accounts by others. So who lived in Sparta? Well, here's a Spartan citizen. His parents were Spartan citizens. So he had certain rights and responsibilities that non-citizens had. He owned land and because he's a man, he has full political rights. And the Spartans themselves, the citizens, made up the smallest proportion of people living in Sparta, and yet they were the ones in control. Okay, here we have another Greek urn. And the, this was made by a free person living in Sparta very similar to the medics in Athens. Um, so they were free, but they were not considered citizens and they were not allowed to take part in the government. Periosi, I believe is how you say it, periosi. And then you've got helots. Helots were the slaves. And they were the ones who did the work on the farms that were in Sparta. They were not allowed to own property. They were never allowed to be citizens. When wars occurred, which it did frequently with Sparta, um, they were expected and forced actually to fight in the Spartan army. There were, the helots made up the larger portion of the population in Sparta. So sometimes, periodically, the Spartans would go and reduce the number of slaves by killing them. Not very nice. But this also helped maintain control over the larger portion of population because if the helots know that they could be killed for any reason at any time, they are less likely to rebel. So those are the different groups who lived in Sparta. So let's talk about the military. Sparta looked down on cities that used walls for protection. Um, they didn't have any walls. They looked at and relied on their own skills to protect them. So the hoplites, the infantry soldiers, you could tell who they were. They would wear a red cloak. And then they had the Greek lambda, the Greek letter L on their shields. You can see one on the top of page 12 in your work so because they wanted strong soldiers, um, I said that when Spartan babies were born, the elders, the elder men would examine them and they would kill any sick or weak or deformed babies, whether they be male or female. So military training started for 
Spartan males at age seven. They were taken from their homes and they were brought to the military barracks. And they did learn to read and write, but it was strictly military for military purposes. And they were also taught how to use weapons. It was a brutal education and training. Um, it is known that the young Spartan boys would be given one piece of clothing every year. They would get that cloak. And that is what they used for clothing. It's what they used as a blanket. Um, and obviously it would get worn and torn and that was it. If, if it was totally destroyed or they lost it, they did not get any other clothing to replace it until the year was up. Um, Spartan boys were not allowed to wear shoes. They were taught to run through those rocky lands with bare feet to build up tolerance and strength in their feet. Uh, they slept outside frequently in all kinds of weather to build up a tolerance to the different weather. And um, what else? They were encouraged to steal food. They were not given much to eat during the day and so it was expected that they would learn how to successfully steal from others. And if they were caught stealing, they were beaten severely. Because if they're going to steal, they had to be good at it. So at age 20, after years of training, they were finally made official soldiers. And they would be sent to defend Sparta's frontier areas. Spartan men were expected to marry at age 30, but they did not live with their families. Okay, so they had wives, they had children, but they lived in the military barracks until they were age 60. At that point, they could retire and go to live with their families. So for Spartan men, it was a very Spartan, spare lifestyle, and it was brutal. As for women, the women were also trained, um, not as brutally, obviously, as the men, because the women didn't fight, although they could have. They were trained in gymnastics. They were taught wrestling and boxing. They were expected to be quite physically fit, not for protection, but so that they could have perfect, healthy Spartan children. Spartan women were married at age 19. And actually, even though it's a... a city-state founded on warfare, women had more rights and freedoms than the women in Athens. Women in Sparta could own their own property. They were allowed to speak their own opinions. The only thing they couldn't do was participate in the government. That was still reserved for the men. But women in Sparta could become very wealthy and influential in their own way. So it's kind of a, an interesting feature of Sparta. And we're gonna look at the government of Sparta. Sparta was ruled by two kings. The positions were hereditary. So even though they're from two different families, um, once a man served as a king, his eldest son would take over for him when he retired or died. And these kings ruled together over the military and they were also considered the high priests of Zeus, the Greek god. All Athenian, or Spartan, sorry, all adult Spartan males were 
required to participate in the assembly once they were uh, age 20. And the assembly would meet once a month, and that's the group that would pass laws and make decisions about whether to go to war or whether to make peace. They would vote by shouting their answers. Um, in Athens, instead of shouting, they would vote by dropping different colored stones into a container. So a white stone would mean yes, and a black stone or gray stone would mean no. They also had five E4s who were considered overseers. They would be chosen by the assembly every year. So they served one year terms. And all eligible male citizens had an equal chance to be chosen. So again, they're chosen by lottery by the assembly. And they had the power to veto any laws made by the assembly. The term veto means to object. So they could object to laws, which would make that law null and void and not a law anymore. And even though they only served for one year, they were never able to serve as an E4 again. You could only do that once. So once for a year only. And then lastly, in Sparta, there was a council of elders. So this was made up of 28 men who were over age 60. Remember that number, age 60, was when you could finally leave the military barracks and return to live with your family. So 28 of these men were the ones who were responsible for proposing laws to the assembly, and then the assembly would make the laws, and the E4s could decide whether to veto them or not. Um, and the elders also served as the highest court in Sparta. And that position was held for life. So from the time they were 60 until the time they died. So that's the government um, and a, a little bit about the Spartans. Let's look at a short video about the Spartans. Being a Spartan was no picnic. If you were a boy, your life was constantly under scrutiny, literally from the day you were born until the day you died. You were seen as a high-level war machine, a workhorse, and the only reason why you were alive was to fight for your country. When you weren't fighting for your country, you were training to fight for your country. In short, you were bred for battle. Today, we're going to find out what life was really like for the average Spartan. But there's one quick thing before we do. This is a good time to subscribe to our channel, Weird History, or just leave a comment and tell us what weird historical society you'd like us to dissect next. This is Sparta. Boys birthed into the Spartan state were under scrutiny practically from the moment they were born. Not long after a woman gave birth to a boy, the infant was taken to a garrisia, a council of leading elder Spartans, where it was inspected like livestock. During this inspection, if the baby boy seemed sick, ill, or mentally or physically handicapped, the newborn was of no use to the Spartan army. While you've probably heard the myths that these discarded babies were thrown into the chasm or placed at the base of Mount Tacitus, they were most likely abandoned in the wilderness or nearby hills. Sometimes these cast-off newborns were found by locals and quietly taken in, but more often than not, they succumbed to exposure. The boys that passed the Garosia test were determined to be healthy and were returned to their families where they were groomed for toughness. These baby boys weren't bathed in water. They were bathed in tubs of wine. It was thought the wine would toughen them up. The belief was that the weaker children would have convulsions and die. These babies were also conditioned to not fear darkness or solitude. And when they cried or complained, their parents and caretakers ignored them. And all this lasted until they were seven years old.
Life was pretty rough for a Spartan boy the first six years of their lives, but it was the best years of their lives compared to how they were treated by the state, which owned them once they turned seven years old. This was the age where the real military training began. At seven, the male child was enrolled in the agoge under the authority of the paidnomus, a Spartan term which translates to a boy herder. This boy herder was a magistrate charged with supervising the education of these young Spartan warriors. The agoge was split into three divisions. The paids, which were made up of boys aged 7 to 17, the paidskois, aged 17 to 19, and the heiboi, aged 20 to 29. Some sources indicate that there were subdivisions by year, even within these classes. In the early paid stage, Spartan boys undergo an intense training regimen. Through this 10-year course, they were forged into fearless warriors, schooled in survival tactics like hand-to-hand -hand combat, war strategizing, and hunting. Female Spartans weren't subjected to quite the same program, but they were trained in dance, gymnastics, and javelin throwing, so they would be strong, healthy mothers. After all, Spartan women were in charge of giving birth to the healthiest future warriors possible. No pressure, no pressure, no pressure. Since we're speaking about Spartan women, it should be known that they were famous in ancient Greece for having more freedom than any other women in the Greek world. To those outside of Sparta, Spartan women had the reputation for promiscuity and controlling their husbands. They were their own persons, with very little rule over them. Spartan women were even able to legally own and inherit property. They were usually better educated, too. And while it's confirmed that Spartans practiced infanticide if newborns were thought to be unhealthy, it's unclear whether this applied to girls as well as boys, although testimony from Plutarch implies it did not. But instead of being turned over to the state for military training, like the boys, it's likely that girls were simply given back to their mothers immediately after birth. It was there that these young girls were raised with a healthy regimen of exercise, with a nutritious diet in order to become physically fit women so they could give birth to healthy babies. As for the aforementioned healthy regimen of exercise, Spartan girls were trained to make themselves as strong as the boys who were getting in shape for war themselves, although the young girls stopped short of combat training. Instead, the physical training for Spartan girls consisted of learning how to properly ride a horse, running, wrestling, throwing the discus and javelin, and trials of strength. When you think about it, it makes sense. The Spartan soldiers abstained from heavy drinking because getting loaded would ruin their sole purpose in life, which was to serve the Spartan army. A wasted soldier was a useless soldier. So Spartan children were taught at an early age that heavy drinking was for slaves only. Every now and then, Spartan soldiers would force their slaves to get drunk to the point of belligerence. Once thoroughly blotto, the soldiers would parade the drunk slaves in front of the local children to let them see how ridiculous they looked. Drinking was a sign of weakness. Of course, soldiers were allowed a glass of wine with a meal, but it took discipline to keep up with the Spartan army, so the heavy drinkers probably didn't survive past their first few battles. Being a Spartan at seven years old meant that you were scrutinized all the time. In regards to clothing, each future soldier was given one garment a year to wear, a red cloak. This was in part a way to prevent the children from gaining too much weight. If you got fat and couldn't figure out how to clothe yourself with what you were given, then the only way to fit in their garment was to exercise and eat less. And these boys didn't even get footwear until they graduated into official military service. The children were forced to walk barefoot, even through the snow. The idea was to harden the bottom of their feet so calluses would form so they could march for miles under any condition. The mess halls also underserved portions to the boys, which were slightly less than filling to promote athletic figures, which always kept them slightly hungry. Plus, if you were fat, then you became a pariah and ran the risk of being banished. While life was fairly rigid for young Spartans, they were allowed to marry. They actually got married all the time, as that was how they kept the birth rate at a constant so that the army always had a steady flow of young boys to train for war. However, because men were devoted to the state and their military service, they were forced to live in barracks. Once you turn 30, you're allowed to live elsewhere, but men who got married earlier were forced to sneak out at night in order to be with their loved ones. Of course, if the boys were caught sneaking away from their barracks, they were beaten as punishment. Not because they snuck away, but because they got caught. Keep in mind, any punishment doled out to these young men never served as a deterrent to the crime. The beating was always given because the men were sloppy enough to get caught. The Spartans were an odd bunch. Unlike their state counterparts in Athens, the people of Sparta weren't concerned with philosophies, the pursuits of arts, 
or anything other than becoming the greatest warrior possible. That said, the Spartans did educate their population. Of course, that education mostly centered on learning war strategies, physical training, and strengthening their mental warfare. Young Spartan girls were not exempt from this kind of war training, even if they didn't have to serve military time the way their male counterparts did. It wasn't uncommon for Spartan boys to be routinely and randomly beaten or hazed. It was done to keep them on their toes and to ensure they grew up tough and on edge. Military leaders would even create tension amongst the boys by initiating fights between them. It was a way to root out the weakest boys and find out who were the strongest. Once a Spartan child showed themselves as weak, they were treated with disdain and violence. Spartan boys were also intentionally underfed to encourage them to steal food for themselves. If they were caught, they were severely punished, not for stealing, but for not being smart enough to get away with the theft. This underfeeding tactic was also meant to produce tough, grizzled soldiers rather than soft, fat ones. Scarce rations also let the boys get used to hunger, and this prevented those hunger pains from being a problem during battle later in life. <laughs> Ancient Sparta wasn't a stranger to social inequality. There were definitely classes, and while the driving force of a Spartan was to serve the military, there was a class system that kept society chugging along. The three main classes were made up of the Spartiate at the top of society, followed by the Pyrosi, and at the bottom, the Helots. The Spartiate were native Spartans who served in the army and had full political and legal rights. This class could trace their ancestry back to the original or first inhabitants of the city. They also enjoyed all of the political and legal rights of the state. They were also the only ones who could participate in politics. They served in the military, led the military, and ran Sparta. Basically, the Spartiate ran the show. Next on the social food chain were the Pyrosi, who were often foreigners. They were the traders and blacksmiths who produced weapons and armor for the military. The blue-collar Johnny Lunchbox is the Sparta. They were taxpayers, they had rights, and they could own land. They even had the right to learn how to read and write. The Pyrosi served in the military too, just as everyone else. The Pyrosi weren't warriors though. They were in charge of the trade and communication with Sparta's neighbors. To be honest, life wasn't all that bad for members of the Pyrosi. Of course, the lowest class of the three were the Helots, who acted as servants and farmers doing menial tasks. And make no mistake, the Spartans hated the Helots. The Helots came from what the Spartans called Helos. Helos was south of Sparta, but due to Sparta's booming population, Sparta expanded its territory when they came to the village of Helos. The Spartans then invaded this village, decimating the people and keeping many as prisoners. Eventually, the Helots became Sparta slaves, though they could earn their freedom by joining the military. Not that it mattered. Even if a Helot earned his freedom, they were still treated like animals. As a matter of fact, it was legal every now and then in Sparta to kill any Helot, even if they were free. It was almost like the movie The Purge, where the government picks one day for its citizens to go ham on each other. No Helot was ever safe. Thanks to having a servant class in the Helots, Spartan women were free from most domestic duties. If they weren't mothers, women kept themselves occupied with pastimes like competitions that judged them on their singing, dancing, throwing, wrestling, and other various sports. According to Spartan artwork and drawings, the girls competed in these activities nude. It's believed that Spartan girls also competed in Gymnopedia, a yearly festival during which naked youths displayed their athletic and martial skills through the medium of war dancing. The event was introduced in 668 BC, concurrently with the introduction of the aforementioned naked activities. Naturally, a lot of these competitive activities and sports were organized to attract Spartan men, but the feats were also designed to prepare them for motherhood. So what do you think? Would you be able to live the life of a Spartan? Let us know in our comments below. All right. Now that we've taken a look at ancient Greece and the city-states of Sparta and Athens, we're going to talk about what led to the decline of ancient Greece. And it's the story of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great is the son of King Philip II of Macedonia. Remember I showed you where that was on the map. So from 359 to 336 BCE, Macedonia, Macedon, was ruled by King Philip II. By the way, we're on page 14 in your workbook. And Philip 
wanted to create a huge army, a standing army that he could use to unify the Greek city states under his rule and go then and destroy the Persian empire. But remember, is that gonna be easy to do to unify the Greek city states? Probably not. However, Sparta and Athens had just finished fighting against each other in the Peloponnesian Wars, and they were both in a weakened state. So that left them open for invasion, and Philip used that to his advantage. So for 23 years, he was able to conquer all of those Greek city-states, not always using his military, but also by marrying strategically his children or the children of Macedonian leaders to Greek leaders. So marriage was another way. So in 336, Philip was getting ready to go to war against the Persians, and he was assassinated. He was murdered. This means that his son, Alexander, became the king of Macedonia. He was only 20 years old at the time. He had already commanded part of the Macedonian army since he was 16 years old. Um, he was very highly respected by his troops and by others. He was well educated. Remember we said he'd been tutored by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And once he became king, his goal was to pick up where his father left off. He wanted to conquer the Persian Empire. At that time, the Persian Empire reached from Egypt in North Africa all the way to the Indian subcontinent. So he will go to war between 336 and 323, and he will defeat the Persians and create one of the largest empires ever at that time. Remember, he had started his leadership when he was 20 years old. Ooh, ignore that. <laughs> so in 327, he marches his troops, continues to go east and conquers lands all the way to the Indus River Valley pretty impressive. He wanted to keep going, but his soldiers had been away from home for a long time, and they begged him to stop and return home. So eventually he gave in and turns his army around. Um, he will stop in Mesopotamia, in Babylon, and this will become the capital of his empire. Unfortunately, he becomes ill in 323 on his way back home, and he dies at age 33, possibly from malaria, but no one's really sure. So if you look at his empire, here's Greece, here's the Mediterranean Sea, whoops, Sorry about that. Um, here is the tip of Italy. So his empire stretched all through Macedonia and Greece. Here is modern day Turkey. He conquered that, he conquered Mesopotamia, he conquered territory on the northern coast of Africa, including Egypt. Okay, he stretches all through what used to be the Persian Empire and here is the Indus River Valley. So it's about here that he stops. So what do we need to really remember about Alexander the Great? One, he did establish the largest empire in the history of civilization at that point. 
but also he created what is known as Hellenistic culture. And if we look at this visual here, it's a great way to imagine it or picture it in your brain. Hellenistic culture was a mix of Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian culture that spread while Alexander was in power. And it will last for 300 years until the Roman Empire emerges. So everywhere that Alexander conquered, he didn't get rid of the cultures of the people he conquered. He sort of brought them in and mixed it with everybody else's that he conquered. So Hellenistic culture or civilization is a blend of all four. All right, let's look at the Venn diagram that you have on page 16 in your workbook. We're gonna look at similarities and differences between Sparta and Athens. If you would like to do this on your own first, go through your notes that we've taken um, and just start listing things that you remember. You can do that. So if you wanna do it independently, you can stop the recording right now and then press play to review, or we can do this together. It doesn't matter whatever you want to do. So I'm gonna start with Sparta. Sparta was ruled by two kings. Their focus was always on military training All male citizens were soldiers in Sparta from the time they were seven, they began their training all the way until they retired at age 60. We know that women had more freedom in Sparta than in Athens. Remember, women in Sparta could own their own property. They could inherit their own property. They could become wealthy. They trained just as hard. Well, maybe not just as hard, but they did train hard to keep physically fit. They left their houses more often, that's for sure. Um, harsh treatment of boys as they're growing up. You saw that if you were lucky to pass the just born stage um, from the time you were born until the time you were seven years old, you were treated very harshly as a child. Your parents would ignore or your mother who is there raising you, your father was usually in the military, um, would allow you to cry. Uh, they paid very little emotional attention to their children trying to strengthen them. And then we talked about the harsh treatment once boys turned age seven and were brought to the barracks to start their training. Brutally harsh treatment. Spartans were not allowed to travel outside of Sparta unless you were part of the military and you were stealing products that you needed from other city states or other areas around the Mediterranean. Um, they didn't go for, you know, educational purposes or vacations to other city states. It was not allowed. Remember, they didn't trust foreigners. They didn't want foreigners in um, Sparta sort of bringing weird ideas. So they did not accept outsiders. We know that they killed babies that were weak. I don't think it mentioned this in the video, but the Spartans used metal rods as a form of currency. They were awkward to carry, so they didn't use it a whole lot. Mostly when Spartans wanted something, they stole it. We know men and women were physically fit. 
men because they had to be able to go to war and women because they were expected to have healthy, strong babies, hopefully boys. Okay, we mentioned that a minute ago. They took what they needed. Remember, um, the only time that they were beaten, the boys, is if they got caught doing things. They were encouraged to steal. They were encouraged to do other things. Um, but if they got caught, that was when they were in trouble. All right, let's look at Athens now. That's on the right side. Their focus was on education and uh, the idea of freedom. They were taught rhetoric, the art of public speaking. You all should teach, take a class in public speaking. We know that the men in Athens had different jobs. They were not only soldiers in Sparta, the slaves did all the work, slaves and servants. Women in Athens had very few rights. Mostly they, were, they stayed at home. Um, if they went to the marketplace, usually they had some servants, some slaves with them. So they didn't have much free time or time to get themselves into trouble. The Parthenon, was the temple, the huge temple on the Acropolis in Athens, and it was built to honor the goddess Athena. The name of Athens was Athene to honor Athena. For boys in Athens, they went to school from age seven to 18. They were pretty well educated. Athenians were encouraged to travel. They were encouraged to learn about new places and write about new places. They were encouraged to bring others back to Athens with them to share their different ideas, something you would not see in Sparta. So Athens accepted foreigners. The Athenians were wealthy. Remember, they had a lot of valuable natural resources like gold and marble. So they actually used coin money, unlike Sparta that used the metal rods. And instead of stealing things that they needed, the Athenians traded for any goods that they needed. Okay, so those are characteristics of Athens. Right, now we're gonna look at some similarities. Oh, I forgot the most important one, democracy. Duh. I'm gonna add that on my list. Democracy. Athens was the birthplace of democracy. Remember, democracy is government where the people participate either indirectly by picking representatives to speak for them, or directly by participating in the government themselves. Athens being a smaller city-state, well, it was a large city-state, but compared to countries that we think of today, they had a smaller population. So they were able to have a direct democracy. All eligible men voted on all issues. All right, let's look at page 17. We'll do some review. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the similarities. Man, all right, similarities between Sparta and Athens. Well, both of those are Greek city-states. Okay, the most powerful. They both practiced the same religion, so they worshiped the same gods and goddesses They both spoke Greek. There may have been some variations, but not much. Um, the Greeks tended to be able to understand each other, even though they developed a little bit separately because of the mountains. 
and both Sparta and Athens had slaves. All right, those go in the middle of the Venn diagram on page 16. Now, let's do a little review. Okay, number one, known as the birthplace of democracy, is it one, Athens, two, Sparta, or three, both? Which one was the birthplace of democracy? Stop the video and answer it. You can circle it, highlight it, whatever. It was Athens, the birthplace of democracy. Remember, Sparta did not have a democratic government. They had two kings that ruled. All right, number two, powerful Greek city-state. Is it one, Athens, two, Sparta, or three, both? What do you think? If you picked three, you were right. Both Sparta and Athens were powerful Greek city-states. Good job. All right. Number three, typically women had more rights and freedoms in this city-state. Is it one, Athens, two, Sparta, or three, both? I want you to pick one. Okay, what'd you say? Number two, Sparta. Women had more rights and freedoms in Sparta. Good job, my friends. All right, you know what it's time for. It's time for documents. Let's see, we're gonna do a CRQ. Constructed response question. Remember, two documents, three questions. So on page 18, we have document one. And this was actually mentioned in the video. Thucydides wrote this. Um, he had taken down the words of Pericles. Pericles was giving a funeral speech to all of the men who had died during the war and Thucydides recorded what Pericles said. So let's look at this document. We can go through it together. So this is 431 BCE. He says, Pericles said, our constitution is called a democracy because the power is in the hands, not of a minority, but of the whole people. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. When it is a question of putting one person before another in a position of public responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class, but the actual ability which the man possesses. No one, so long as he has it in him to be of service to the state is kept in political obscurity because of poverty. And just as our political life is free and open, so is our day-to-day -day life in our relations with each other. We do not get into a state with our next door neighbor if he enjoys himself in his own way nor do we give him the kind of blank looks which though do no real harm, still do hurt people's feelings. We are free and tolerant in our private lives, but in public affairs, we keep to the law. This is because it commands our deep respect. We give our obedience to those whom we put in positions of authority and we obey the laws themselves, especially those which are for the protection of the oppressed and those unwritten laws, which it is an acknowledged shame to break. 
Here, each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of the state as well. Even those who are mostly occupied with the affairs of their own business are extremely well informed on general politics. This is a peculiarity of ours. We do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. We Athenians, in our own persons, take our decisions on policy or submit them to proper discussions, for we do not think there is an incompatibility between words and deeds. The worst thing is to rush into action before the consequences have been properly debated. So that's a mouthful. Question number one says, describe the historical circumstances that led to the development of the political ideas expressed in the document. All right, so we are looking for historical context. We want to take what Pericles said and put it into context. Remember, that means where, what, who, why, those kind of questions. So what I'd like you to do right now is turn the video off, and I want you to put this document into historical context. So obviously, if it's Pericles, you know we're talking about Athens. He was the ruler of Athens during its golden age. You know what kind of city-state Athens was. You know, you could talk about that. Okay, You know about the geography and how it caused Athens to develop differently than other city-states. And you know what kind of government they developed. Okay, so that's all historical context. So write it using complete sentences and then press play when you're ready to review. Okay, my friends, welcome back. Remember, your answers do not have to be the same as mine. In fact, they shouldn't be the same. Everyone's answer is going to be different because you all write differently, you all think differently. So here is what I said. I said that this statement was made describing Athens in 431 BCE. Athens was a powerful Greek city-state. The city-states developed their own forms of government and traditions. Athens developed into a democracy where all eligible citizens were required to participate in making decisions for the city-state itself. There are so many other things I could have written. I could probably write a whole page on this, but you just want the reader to understand that you know Pericles was the ruler of Athens. You, you want the reader to know that you understand what Athens was, how it was governed, that kind of stuff. All right, so that is document number one, question one. Now we are going to look at document two. Okay, document two is by Xenophon, Xenophon, a Greek historian and philosopher. And he, in this writing, is writing about Spartan society under the rule of Lycurgus. So Xenophon is a Greek historian and philosopher, obviously not from Sparta. Um, and he's writing about Spartan society under Lycurgus's rule. Okay, so let's follow along, page 19. When we turn to Lycurgus, instead of leaving it to each member of the state privately to appoint a slave to be his son's tutor, 
he set over the young Spartans a public guardian, a ped nomos, with complete authority over them. This guardian was elected from those who filled the highest magistracies. He had authority to hold musters of the boys, in other words, to gather them together, and as their guardian, in case of any misbehavior, to chastise severely, punish them severely. Lycurgus further provided the guardian with a body of youths in the prime of life and bearing whips to inflict punishment when necessary with this happy result, that in Sparta, modesty and obedience ever go hand in hand, nor is there lack of either. When Lycurgus first came to deal with the question, the Spartans, like the rest of the Hellens, the rest of the Greeks, used to mess privately at home. They used to eat at home tracing more than half the current problems to this custom he was determined to drag his people out of holes and corners into the broad daylight and so he invented the public mess rooms so public eating places for the men as to food his ordinance his laws allowed them only so much as should guard them from want, so that from beginning to end till the mess breaks up, the common board is never stinted for food, nor yet extravagantly furnished. They weren't given a whole lot to eat is what that means. So also in the matter of drink, while putting a stop to all unnecessary drink, he left them free to quench thirst when nature dictated. Thus, there is the necessity of walking home when a meal is over and a consequent anxiety not to be caught tripping under the influence of wine, since they all know, of course, that the supper table must be presently abandoned and that they must move as freely in the dark as in the day, even with the help of a torch. No drinking, no excessive drinking. Lycurgus also provided for the continued cultivation of virtues, even to old age, by fixing the election to the council of elders as a last ordeal at the goal of life thus making it impossible for a high standard of virtuous living to be disregarded even in old age. So even once you retired from the military at age 60, you were still except, expected to be able to serve in the council of elders. So you were continuously expected to behave as a proper Spartan man. Moreover, he laid upon them, like some irresistible necessity, the obligation to cultivate the whole virtue of a citizen. Provided they duly perform the injunctions of the law, the city belonged to them each and all in absolute possession and on equal footing. Whew, all right. Question two, oops, that should say question two. Based on this excerpt, explain Lycurgus's purpose for establishing the lifestyle described above. So based on what we read about what Lycurgus ordered and all the changes he made, what do you think his purpose was? Okay, so stop this video. Type a response on page 19, and then press play to review. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here. Here's what I said. I said Lycurgus wanted Spartans to be absolutely loyal to their city-state, be willing to protect it with their disciplined military, and be willing to take part in the government. I should have said 
till the, the day they died. So as long as you have something that sounds like this, you know, they wanted Spartans to be of strong character their entire lives. They want Spartans to be strong in mind and body to protect their people, something along those lines, then you are good to go. Okay, let's look at number three. Question three is always relating to documents one and two, okay? So this question says, using evidence from both documents, identify, so mention, and explain a similarity or a difference, one similarity or one difference between the political development of Athens and Sparta. So what is one thing that they had in common about government? And what was one thing or what was one thing that they differed in relation to government? Okay, because it's asking about political development. And you have to use evidence from the document. This is gonna take you a little bit longer. You can change the font size on page 20, make it smaller if you like. All right, so I'd like you to turn the video off. I would like you to compose a response and don't forget to use the text evidence. One similarity or one difference. Okay, press pause now. All right, welcome back, friends. I hope you did well with this. All right, the first thing you'll notice is, oh, that I have a typo. That's the first thing I noticed. But anyway, <laughs> the first thing to notice is that I mentioned document one evidence and document two evidence, and I put it at the end or at the be in the middle of this sentence and at the end of that one, um, just so when the reader on the Regents exam goes to see if you had text evidence, they can just look and say, oh, yep, text evidence, text evidence. So I would do that in your answer. So I put um, a similarity between Athens and Sparta is the view of citizen participation in the government. So here I identified a similarity. A similarity is the view of citizen participation in the government. Boom. Okay, now I have to explain it. So in both Athens and Sparta, male citizens were expected to take part in the government. So that is the explanation. And now I have to use text evidence. In Athens, those who had no interest in politics had no business being there. I should have said, I just didn't have enough room. I should have said, according to Pericles in his funeral oration, he stated that if you have no interest in politics, you should not even be in Athens because it was expected that all eligible males take part in government. And then according to Xenophon, Sparta, in Sparta, men looked forward to participating in the Council of Elders once they turned age 60. So you could have said throughout their lives, they were expected to take part in their government even after all their years of military service. All right. Again, yours does not have to be the same and it won't. And that's okay as long as you followed the directions. All right, we are done with ancient Athens. I am sure that you learned a whole lot. I know that I enjoy teaching about Athens and Sparta and ancient Greece as a whole. So we are good to go. And until next time, my friends, have a good day.